You are in the meeting now. So I guess we'll kick it off then. So um, I'd like to thank. Uh, I guess we'll get the speaker. So I'd like to thank everyone for joining us and um, putting a delay in your travel plans wherever you're allowed to go right before the long weekend and joining us for this uh, session on what promises to be an outstanding uh, lineup of speakers and, and I think will be a really exciting discussion. Um, at this point, I, I'd just like to recognize that we're conducting our business today on the traditional homelands of Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. And um, I guess next slide. Uh, my, my name is David Granville and I'm the, the host of this uh, session, the Discovery to Commercialization. Uh, next slide. Um, so this session was started about a year ago. It's focused on, as, as I mentioned before, on, on uh, bringing academics uh, and clinicians and scientists together and really starting to build a bridge across the three. I think during COVID, we, we realized that when, when you bring um, academics, clinicians, and scientists together, you can accomplish great things in, in a, a much more exp expedited fashion. Um, so the, the purpose of this is not only to bring people together, but then also help uh, trainees as well as others across the community to start understanding what others do and build those relationships. Uh, next slide. Uh, so I'll, I'll let Fabio, Fabio is our moderator today, and I'll, I'll let him discuss this, but we have some really top-notch uh, speakers today, um, as many of you are aware, which probably re is probably reflected by the number of people on this uh, in this session today that um, Vancouver is a powerhouse in, in, in you know, cell therapies and, and regenerative medicine. Um, so it should, should be a really exciting session. Uh, next slide. Uh, just a few housekeeping details. So what will happen is we'll ask the four speakers, they'll all give, give about a 10 minute um, talk and then at the end there'll be a chance for uh, questions and discussion um, please uh, use the chat function to ask any of your questions. And I think everybody's automatically put on mute uh, for the session. And, and Fabio will a a ask the questions when they're, when they're put in the, in the chat box. Next slide. Uh, so at this point, it's my pleasure to introduce the moderator for this uh, session, Dr. Fabio Rossi. So Fabio is a professor and director at the Biomedical Research Center. He's also the Associate Director of the School of Biomedical Engineering at UBC, as well as the Director of the BC Regenerative Medicine Initiative. Um, he, after completing his medical degree in Genoa in Italy, uh, Fabio completed a, a PhD in Thomas Graff's lab at uh, the European Molecular Biology um, Laboratories in Heidelberg, Heidelberg Germany, uh, followed by um, a postdoc in Helen Blau's lab at Stanford. Um, so at this point, I will pass the microphone over to you, Fabio, to moderate and introduce the rest of the speech. Thank you, David. <clears throat> Thank you for the introduction. I must say that uh, I need uh, to put out one correction, and it's not your fault because the situation has changed yesterday. As of today, the Biomedical Research Center no longer exists, and it has been completely subsumed by the School of Biomedical Engineering, which means I am free from management duties for the center, <laughs> no longer the director. Woohoo! So, uh, you know, after this joyous announcement, uh, we can then now talk a bit about uh, uh, what we're going to listen to today. So, uh, I thought uh, I'd bring together a few people that are involved in different stages of the translation of the therapy from, uh, uh, you know, the bench side to the clinic. And the clinic is not really close for uh, these uh, uh, approaches, except, uh, uh, you know, perhaps in the case of Tim Kiefer. But essentially what we have is uh, two excellent academics, uh, Megan and Tim, uh, who are working at uh, uh, um, essentially putting a cell product, a modified cell product, through the, uh, to the clinics, in, and uh, they are going to tell us uh, the difficulties involved in this. And then we have two companies. One of them is uh, represented by <clears throat> Jeremy Brock and uh, is uh, the very new Notch Therapeutics. Notch is one of the uh, big successes of the Center for, for Commercialization of Regenerative Medicine in, in uh, Toronto, where it started, but is now a BC company and uh, has recently um, you know, uh, had a, a, a 
I think over 10 million dollar of funding uh, uh, deal. So uh, this is, uh, you know, a part of a new trend in Canada in that, you know, people that can actually set up these large regenerative oriented companies are no longer running away to the States. Uh, they're finally staying in Canada and actually getting the support that they need around here. And uh, and then, of course, uh, there is a, a aspect that you, this is aspect is one of the most innovative uh, uh, um, spin-off that UBC has put out in a while, and uh, um, is a very very interesting business model that has to do with the bioprinting tissues. And so Sam Woodford, with his uh, famously nice British accent, will tell us about uh, the story today. Um, so I uh, <clears throat> don't want to take too much time, and I will go ahead and uh, immediately introduce uh, Greg uh, to the audience. Uh, Gregory uh, Block has uh, a long history in uh, uh, cell therapy companies. Um, is uh, currently the vice president of corporate development at Notch. This is a job that he had, I think, uh, for uh, just about a year or less. And uh, before doing that, he was uh, involved in the founding and uh, building of uh, a company down in Seattle called uh, Universal Cells that was more recently acquired by Astellas. Uh, if I remember correctly, Greg, the company in Seattle, uh, the main goal was the generation of uh, 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 universal donor cells that uh, could be transplanted in any immunocompetent recipient without too much immunosuppression. Um, now, uh, more recently, Greg has been uh, working with Notch, and uh, I have actually never heard anybody from Notch give a talk except for Peter Blansbra, who is the scientific founder, uh, one of the scientific founders of the company. So I'm very curious to hear from Greg how uh, uh, their attempts of generating uh, functional uh, immune cells starting from polypotent stem cells are going and uh, what's the path leading there. Um, Greg, uh, you have the floor. Thanks, Fabio. I'm going to share my screen here. Um, and I think I'm going to share this one. Yeah. Can you see my slide? Yes. I put it in presenter view. Does it make everything weird? Made my screen all black. Yeah, now it's weird. It's a black screen with a white stripe down the middle. Um, what is going on? <laughs> the usual zoom. Okay, let me stop the share and try again. And I will share it again. Oh, hang on. Let me, let me just um, escape here. So let me let me just start ranting while I get this um, while I get this set up. It says screen share failed. Please try again later. Um, so try again. Maybe you can rant about the beautiful guitar collection you have behind. I already <laughs> did. <laughs> the uh, yeah, it's, that's my guitar collection. Um, let me try this one more time. Sorry, guys. Do you see my screen? Yes. I'm just going to leave it off of um, presenter mode because it will just be weird. Um, I, I'm already going to disappoint you, Fabio. I didn't prepare a talk about Notch, um, although I will touch upon Notch in, in the talk. Um, uh, you know, since this was a community event, I decided to talk more about you know, my experience starting companies in the regenerative medicine space and buying companies in the regenerative medicine space. And as I was making it, I thought to myself, man, I better put this disclosure in because I might say things that get me in trouble. And um, so these are my own views. This is not a notch corporate presentation. This is, you know, me contributing to my community. Um, and I thought I would start to talk by thinking, you know, why is it that we would want to commercialize an invention in the first place? Um, because a lot of times we're talking to people who are, um, you know, wanting to take their innovations out of the university and build these, you know, fund these companies and, and get it towards a place that really brings value to the society. 
And I've come in contact with people who, who you know, really manage to get the right stuff together and some people who do it with different reasons. Um, and so I put a little, you know, just a little bit of uh, maybe a bit flippant, but there's kind of like the right attitude to why you would want to commercialize an invention. You know, you're bringing something of value to society. It needs a lot of funding and you're going to get that funding either by a non-dilutive or dilutive investment um, uh, opportunities. And that there's, there, that there, at the core of it, there's, there's a value proposition that exists, meaning that, you know, as you invest into something over time, it's going to generate value. Um, and that value, you know, the way people are thinking about it these days is, you know, especially in the healthcare sector is, you know, can you improve patient outcomes um, at least an order of magnitude over standard of care while also reducing costs? And if you can't really meet that, then it's like, maybe don't bother. Um, and then some people, you know, they want to just be rich and, or they can't fund their research just by normal granting mechanisms and they try to assemble companies and I've usually found that those ones are maybe a little <laughs> less uh, uh, exciting. Um, so um, as we talk about commercializing therapeutics, I, I think the, the fundamental framework is, you know, there's a typical continuum that exists with, with all scientists. You know, you start in the discovery realm and you move it all towards uh, commercialization through the, you know, through the regulatory path. Um, it's, it's a risk game. So you're driving value as you move to the right, um, but you're starting with a very high risk proposition that may or may not work. Um, and you're investing capital all the way along the lines until you get to the end. Um, and instead of saying low risk here, I put less risk because even once you get to commercialization, risk uh, still exists. Um, you know, a perfect example is uh, blood clots with a vaccine. Um, and uh, I just need to move everyone out of the way because I can't actually see my own slides. Um, and so, you know, the, the question is like, where do you incubate your discoveries? Do you bring them out at the discovery stage and start commercializing very early? Or do you start, uh, do you, you incubate it into in university even more? Um, uh, so you, you start to do the preclinical toxicity studies within the university, maybe even do the phase one or two studies in the university, um, and then spin them out of there. Um, and, you know, the answer is all of the above. It, it doesn't matter. It kind of depends on the environment that you're in. And as I'll explain to you, we're kind of in an environment right now um, that's amenable to sort of earlier stage investments with a long time frame or long window um, to eventual commercialization. And one of the things that I wanted to touch upon that's really interesting about cell therapy and immune oncology, um, and this, this differs to a talk I, I gave at UBC once where I said that, you know, it's not really an industry yet because there's no commercial product. And so why would, you know, we're just kind of all investing into this thing that is maybe going to be a thing one day. Um, but that's changed. You know, cell therapy IO companies are now represented along the continuum of, of this space. We have commercialized approved uh, cell therapies that are given to people all over the world that generate hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue. We understand the reimbursement model. A lot of the risks that existed are, are no longer there. So you know, I have this comment here that the industry is now real and we can think about supporting it from our, our innovative in engines in our community. And so I thought a nice way to structure this talk um, would be to compare and contrast two very similar discovery stage companies that have been involved in, um, in the context of the environment as it existed at the time and the different business models that arose. Um, and then I'll discuss those at the end. And so, um, the first slide I'll show is a description of um, my first company, which was called Universal Cells. Um, as Fabio alluded to, this was a company that was started out of the University of Washington. Um, uh, we licensed um, technologies that enabled us to edit pluripotent stem cells, to remove the HLA genes um, so that we could create universal donor stem cells that could be used in any patient. Um, the goal was really to be able to fund the boiling down to practice of um, creating a clinical grade product in, in a GMP facility with, you know, viruses that were all clinical grade and, you know, really doing all that process development work and, and, and very difficult documentation work. When we started it, we didn't really have that mindset of like creating product. It was more about creating that platform and getting into the clinic. And then it, as, as we sort of evolved, we decided you know, in order to drive maximal value into this company, um, we would um, we would 
do research on potential applications. And when you have a universal donor cell, you could think about you know things like uh, beta cells, like Tim is working on, or um, T cells, like uh, Notch is working on. Um, and we ended up deciding on a natural killer cell program. That's another type of blood cell that's pretty you know relatively easy to make from a from a pluripotent stem cell source. Um, and we also did a number of licensing deals and carving out the space of the universal donor cell in different fields. Um, and so we were able to build this company to about 27 full-time employees between 2013 and 2018, um, simply off of a small seed uh, round from friends and family, an SBIR grant, um, the revenue from the licensing. Um, but we ultimately decided, um, you know, the best home for this type of technology um, would, because it was still fairly early, would be in, in, in a sort of like-minded, value-aligned um, partner. Um, we had signed a licensing agreement with Estellas Pharma and decided afterwards that it would be better if we just merged the companies. So they purchased us for um, in a $102 million transaction where we continued to build out the platform. And to give you a sense of how the, the field emerged and how you know investment is going into this space, you know, following that acquisition, we deployed nearly a billion dollars to support the program, um, including the 2019 um, uh, purchase of Zyphos Biosciences down in South San Francisco, which was a transaction I led, and, uh, and a, a, a more robust deal with, with the um, UK-based cell therapy company Adaptimmune. So, you know, you, you can kind of imagine the, the investment dollars coming up. And Notch Therapeutics, you know, it was also, it's a discovery stage for a potent stem cell company in the IO space. Instead of focusing on NK cells, the focus of this company is T cells. The, the, the core of the technology is, was licensed from the from Plenty Book Research Institute in the University of Toronto. We call it the engineer's thymic niche. It's these, um, it's these, uh, these beads that basically allow us to deliver the right signals at the right time. And what that's allowed us to do is unlock the ability to produce T cells from any source of hematopoietic stem cells, including pluripotent stem cell derived hematopoietic stem cells. Um, and so, you know, this, this company was created in a much different environment with a much different philosophy in mind. Um, the intention was to build a fully integrated company of scale to deliver on the promise of allogeneic T cell therapies for curing cancer, because we know in the environment now that, you know, this is something that could be achieved. Um, and we have this long-term vision of building a pipeline of T-cell products. And, you know, similar to universal cells, we started with a small seed round and we had a capital influx from, an, from, a, from a partnership, um, which helped validate the technology platform because it's a publicly traded um, company called Allergene Therapeutics. That actually, you know, for a, for a small Canadian company, the, that capital influx was quite substantial. Let us build out a team. Let us attract a senior leadership team that ultimately led to us um, triggering an $85 million U.S. Uh, Series A financing, um, which to my knowledge is one of the largest financings for a Canadian biotech company in, in history. Um, and we're now uh, about 40 FTE in three sites. Um, we have offices and labs in Toronto, in Vancouver, um, and we now have three people on the ground in Seattle and growing. Um, so you can, you know, these are both discovery stage companies and they're quite different. And so, you know, what's changed in the environment? Um, and, you know, essentially these are two very different things that look different because of the changes that have happened in the environment. So if you look at the technology stage, you know, universal cells was more focused on the starting materials, as I had mentioned, um, whereas Notch Therapeutics is focused on an effector cell type right out the gate that we know if we create an allogeneic version of it, will bring value to patients. Um, we're five years later in history. Um, when we started universal cells, the, the, um, we, we brought together a group of consultants who literally said, don't do this. Um, what a terrible idea. And we did it anyways because that's what risk is. Um, and uh, whereas if you look at the external landscape now and how it's proved, you know, there's a clear acknowledgement from the community that, um, that allogeneic cells are the holy grail um, for being able to take this complex process for treating patients and turning it into a more traditional medicine. So that the industry has matured. Um, I wouldn't say it's, it's very mature yet. We're still working out a lot of kinks, uh, manufacturing challenges, distribution challenges, patient engagement challenges. So it really is going to take the entire community internationally to help this industry mature. Um, we also, you know, at the beginning stages of universal cells, um, the, the 
available knowledge for being able to get insight into what you put into a regulatory package was scant. There had been, you know, very few pluripotent stem cell based therapeutics taken to the clinic. There was there was the precedent of Giron and later uh, Biocyte. Um, and, but, you know, that there, there wasn't a lot of trained people in the community, consultants, et cetera, et cetera. How do you get your starting material, for example? Whereas if you look at it now, um, you know, a number of PSD-based uh, um, products have been taken to the clinic in different jurisdictions. The, the risks are more clear, not perfect. It's not like an antibody thug where you know what to do. Um, you know, there's still risks we'll have to resolve, but there's a lot more um, um, support. Um, the, the other thing that's changed a lot is, is the story. Um, when we were pitching universal donor cells in 2013, it was, a, it was quite an esoteric and nuanced message that eventually became obvious to people who were trying to develop these therapeutics. Whereas when we say the same words now in, in, in 20, you know, 2021, it's, um, it's, it's pretty obvious. Um, and then of course, you know, the economic environment has changed substantially and that's been bolstered by the pandemic um, and the, the money that's sitting on the sidelines to be invested into biotech and the life sciences. Um, so in my last slide, I thought I would uh, rant a little bit about, um, you know, some of my take-home messages if you're thinking about spinning out companies from the university. Um, you know, one of the things I think that you can't do perfectly from your vantage point, but you can put work into to, to try and understand where you are in, in, in the continuum of drug discovery um, and what your value proposition is and how you're going to kind of de-risk it over time and what the perceived um, value inflection points will be. Um, you really want to be able to reach those value inflection points in a capital efficient manner, which involves not being capital constrained. Um, that involves seeking as much advice as possible. Um, you know, and we have wonderful resources in Vancouver. If you look at like the, the Creative Destruction Labs and, and uh, Life Sciences BC um, and Life Sciences Innovation Northwest, there's, there's all these resources out there in our community um, that can help you decide what the best way to sort of inject capital into your company is. Um, and you, you obviously want to assemble a team around it. It's not something where you necessarily want to go solo. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that um, I think helped us made a lot of really interesting decisions, you know, ultimately you, you're going to be the, um, the, you know, the last point. I'll go back to the second last point. The last point is that, you know, you're ultimately the product of the decisions that you make and, you, you know, you're always making the difficult decisions over time. But if you want to align those against some sort of North Star, it's about aligning it to the value of your technology. So if you think your technology is going to cure cancer, it's your sort of obligation to get it there as right and as fast as possible or you're holding it back from patients. And that involves a lot of bravery. And so my last, um, uh, cleverness too, but my last thing that I always tell people that I'm training or that people that are on my teams is, is to be brave because, um, you know, we, we can't de risk everything in this field. Um, and I don't know how long I've been speaking. Hopefully it was 10 minutes, and I'll stop. Thank you, Fabio. Thank you very much, Jeremy. That was a very nice overview. Um, <clears throat> I would just like to uh, remind the audience that if they have any questions for you, uh, they put it in the chat, and we will address them at the end uh, during the discussion period. Um, I make my own note. Don't worry, you'll get questions. And... Uh, <clears throat> The next speaker now uh, is uh, Megan Levin. So I have, uh, me and Megan have known each other for the past 20 years probably, or how long she's been at uh, UBC. And uh, during this period, she really established herself as one of the leaders of um, innovation in this university. You just heard from, uh, uh, <clears throat> from uh, um, Gregory that uh, uh, the goal of Notch is to generate T cells for immunotherapy of cancer, so CAR T cells, you know. Um, I'm sure there's going to be many other flavors and, and uh, things that Notch will, will do in the future. We never know where something's going to end up. Megan has been uh, uh, trying to uh, implement a similar model. Uh, and when I say a similar model, I mean, you know, a model in which the right cell gets tickled by a signal and you decide which signal it is, is a way, in a way, it is a synthetic biology approach imparting uh, on the cell a new function, except that instead of uh, choosing cells that are 
angry and want to kill cancer cells, Megan has chosen the opposite. She has chosen T regulatory cells, uh, of which she was involved in the discovery in the early days. And uh, um, she's trying to get T-reg cells to do what they want. And I don't want to, you know, it's obvious where, where this is going, but I'm going to let, let uh, Megan uh, go through uh, the details. And so, Megan, please, uh, you have the floor, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, hearing about your progress and you're trying to move, how do you call them, car T-regs? Uh, car T-regs. Yeah, yeah, car T-regs. Okay, I need to uh, boot you out, I think, and then get myself in. And let's see if the screen sharing works better than it did with Greg. Is that good? Yeah, yeah, it's good. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so thanks very much for the opportunity to speak to you guys today. I think it's going to be a really interesting discussion at the end. So when thinking about what I should present today, um, I decided what I do is take you a little bit through the journey that my lab has been on and then end with some of my reflections, which hopefully will set the stage for some discussion. So Fabio mentioned my lab's been working on regulatory T cells for more than 20 years with the idea that you can use these cells as a cell-based therapy to uh, control transplant-related rejection, autoimmune disease, and other chronic inflammatory diseases. And the, the biology of Tregs has been known for more than 20 years, and essentially what we can do is take Tregs from a person, uh, grow them up in the lab, make lots of them, and then put them back. Uh, and when we put them back in large numbers, um, you can control immune responses, uh, and the most important property of Tregs is their ability to reshape the whole immune system and induce what we call um, a long-term tolerance, which means that a one or two injections of Tregs is enough, at least in animal models, to reset the whole system so that you're actually potentially giving a cure for the disease. Um, and that's what's making them so attractive in terms of an industry application because it could be a short-term treatment for a long-term benefit. So as I mentioned, Treg biology has been known for a long time, and actually there's more than 40 phase one clinical trials that have been uh, completed or, or ongoing in all sorts of different diseases. But until recently, there's been very little academic interest. I would say virtually, if not all of these phase one trials were done in the academic setting and then just kind of petered out and went nowhere. So we have a ton of data out there showing that Treg therapy is safe but because they've all been phase one safety trials, we don't actually know yet if they're effective. And so why is that? Why was there 20 years of lack of interest in, in industry? And I think it's really come down to the fact that there was a lack of intellectual property. There was not, no IP related to T-reg composition of matter because you can't put intellectual property on someone's cells. There were some patents around sorting them in particular ways, but it's pretty easy to, you know, you can't really make a company out of that. And so there just wasn't that IP to grab onto. Um, as you just heard from Gregory, cell therapy is extremely expensive, logistically complex, and uh, until not uh, rules the world, highly personalized. Um, I also think it's important to remember that the largest market for regulatory T cells is a, a challenging population of patients. Um, autoimmune patients. It's not a life-threatening disease. It's not like cancer where you have this very compelling, you know, person is not going to make it type situation. Most autoimmune diseases are slow, smoldering conditions that um, can mostly be controlled by many biologics and small molecules. And there's a huge market out there of, of other types of treatments you could take apart from the cell therapy. But of course, none of those are curative in the long term. Uh, and really, I think the biggest unmet need and the biggest potential for regulatory cell therapy is in transplantation. But Big Pharma considers transplantation to be completely boutique, not enough money and not interested. Um, and so I think all of these different points added up to 20 years of very little industry interest in regulatory T cells. So what changed? Um, I think reflecting back what really changed um, was the CAR T cell field and the immune oncology field. So most of you probably know this amazing story of CAR T cells, which mm -hmm. I think really caught everyone's attention with the success of this first uh, child, uh, Emily Whitehead, who was treated with CAR T cells and basically cured. She's still alive and doing well. 
Um, that happened in 2012. And if you just look at this timeline of the number of patent documents filed, you can see there's Emily treated right there, and you can see what happens to patents after that. So I think that's when the possibility that cell therapy could actually be a really um, viable opportunity for industry took off. Um, and of course, this, this is now, there's two FDA-approved products out there with a personalized CAR T-cell therapy. This is the Novartis product. So, but it's interesting to note that CARs have been around for a really long time. This is um, a timeline going back to 2003, but you can also go back further in history. So what I just told you here with the first pediatric um, treatment treated 2012, child treated in 2012, you can see there was a huge amount of work that has been done before that. In fact, CARs in their first instance were, were worked on in the early 1990s. So there's a lot of basic science that ultimately led up to this industry um, investment. And if you look here, all the, all the patents before about 2012 were all uh, academics. And then suddenly around 2012, Novartis came to the table and that really changed the whole landscape. The other thing that's really interesting to notice is that the field of CAR T cells has been really a, an integrated effort between academia and interest. So this is this interesting connectivity map between patents held by academics versus companies. And what you'll see is that the companies in the academia um, environment are completely um, linked together. And I think this is quite unique. I'd be interested to hear that the industry people get their perspective on this. But from what I can see, something like a small molecule would not be like this. Small molecules are mostly developed in industry and academia may, may give them the targets, but they don't end up developing the small molecules. So this, the success of cell, cell therapy from the cancer world has really required academia and industry to work together. So where did I come into this? I came across this email actually when I was looking for something else on my computer the other day and it was just kind of shocked me to look back. So this is the first time I thought about CAR T cells and it was because I had been uh, part of a teen grant led by Jonathan Bramson and it was all about oncology and they brought me on as a Treg expert just because they thought it would be a good idea. And I was learning about all these CAR T cells and I sent Jonathan this email that says, uh, you know, hi, we've been mulling over an idea about using CARs and Tregs. Not for cancer, obviously, and that was um, in 2010. So um, this is what got us on this path to the idea that you could take a, a chimeric antigen receptor. So this is an engineered receptor that has an antibody on the extracellular domain and different uh, T-cell receptor good things on the inside, um, and put them into regulatory T-cells so that you could control their antigen specificity. And because my lab was interested in transplantation, we thought that there would be a really good application in this context because um, there's a lot of HLA mismatch transplants that happen around the world. Um, HLA-A2, which is a, uh, expressed in about 50% of the patient population, which translates to about a quarter of transplants being done in the recipients who are HLA-A2 negative receiving an HLA-A2 positive organ. And the idea was that if we could express a CAR in the patient's regulatory T cells, it would uh, cause these cells to migrate and be activated locally at the site of the transplant. Um, so that was the idea, uh, and this is the paper that we published basically showing that that idea seemed to, um, the hypothesis seemed to be correct. So these are some data uh, in a graph versus host disease model where we were looking at the ability of the CAR T rates in red to control a xenogenetic graft versus host disease response. And essentially, like, the big picture was these are the unmodified t regs in blue, and these are the modified t regs in red. And you can just see there was this amazing effect of putting the, the car in, in the t regs. So this was published in 2016. And I would say about two days after this paper came out, I got a phone call from a company called TXL. And um, they were really interested in developing a collaboration. But we had no intellectual property because I, was, I hadn't even thought about the fact that this could be um, important for IP. And so we made our original car with an antibody that we just bought from ATCC. So ATCC owns the sequence of that antibody. Um, but they, nevertheless, uh, really wanted to pursue this because they saw the value in the idea, and so they jumped in and um, initiated a large collaborative research agreement with us to create IP around the concept. And so what we did actually was work with the CDRD to humanize our original car, 
which then allowed us to come up with unique sequences that we were able to protect. We ended up making 20 humanized cars, and um, this is just some data um, showing the proof of concept that these uh, humanized CAR T regs could control skin allograft rejection. And uh, essentially, if you just this is a model where we put a piece of human skin onto a mouse, and then we put human T cells into that mouse, uh, which would reject the skin. And if you add in our red A2 CAR T cells, this is just the skin here. You can see the beautiful epithelial uh, layer here preserved with the A2 CAR T regs where it's totally destroyed in the mice that just got CBMCs. So this, um, uh, this is the histology scoring. So these data provided the proof of concept and the, the key preclinical data package that uh, TXL needed to really take this forward to the next stage. So shortly after we published that paper and secured all of our IP, TXL put themselves in the market, which is essentially what they've been planning to do all the time, we kind of knew that, and they were bought by a much larger company that's on the, the NASDAQ, Sangamo Therapeutics, um, and Sangamo is now taking the, our CAR T reg therapy forward to a first uh, in human clinical trial and kidney transplantation. So I think it's interesting to reflect that because we partnered with industry, we published our paper, you know, pure academia, no IP in 2016, and there was a clinical trial approved in 2019. Uh, and so there's just no way that me as a UBC professor could have ever gone on a similar sort of timeline without, a, without the industry support. Um, particularly, as you heard from Gregory, that the cell manufacturing part of it is so complicated and, and so expensive. So TXL and Sangamo together have um, you know, a huge group of more than 50 people who developed this manufacturing protocol, worked with a sophisticated CRO to get all the uh, protocols in shape and to do all their regulatory affairs. It's a very, very expensive proposition. So uh, what are my perspectives on cell therapy um, commercialization? So when I, when I look back at the process that we've been through, and as I'm interacting with many companies now on a more regular basis, I see that the companies, it's important to remember the companies really do need academic innovation. Um, so I think my lab was ahead of the curve. We've been thinking outside the box because we've been interacting with somebody working in a totally different space from what we had been working on, and that's really what academia enables. You meet people that have ideas that that allow you to do things that you would not be able to do in the context of industry. But I think in cell therapy, academia really needs industry to really to fully realize the commercial potential because it's just not feasible to take a cell therapy beyond maybe a phase two trial if you're at a really big institution. But uh, at least in the current context in, um, in Canada, it, it's pretty hard to do much more than a phase one trial of cell therapy in a university. I often think about whether I regret partnering with an industry partner or, or not. And I guess the, you know, the biggest regret is that you lose control, that you, you know, we're not doing the clinical trial. We're sort of peripherally involved, but it's not in my hands anymore. And so that is somewhat of a, a regret. But on the other hand, if you look back to what Gregory said, ultimately you're tr what you're trying to do is get products into patients. There's just no way that we would have been able to get this technology into clinical testing so quickly, um, especially in the Canadian context where you know I can't imagine how many CHR grants I would have had to write <laughs> to get the money that was needed to bring that forward. It would not have been possible to do it in that timeline uh, with the person available and, and the, the cost of cell therapy manufacturing. So I think you know I kind of have a little bit of a regret of not being the one leading that trial, but overall I think it was absolutely the right decision. Um, and I think looking forward in the next 10 years, that as we start getting companies like Notch, uh, we start uh, in the community, we have more GMP capacity, that it will the next time be more feasible to take it further on my own without having to have an industry partner right at the very beginning. So I'll end there. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Megan. Uh, very interesting. I also realized that I was uh, uh, delinquent in, in introducing you, and I forgot to recite the litany of prizes that you got in the past, <laughs> years, which are quite impressive. I will try to acknowledge them uh, later at the end. But, uh, you know, one of the uh, things was uh, <clears throat> 
that you have been nominated, well, given the award of the uh, YWCA Woman of Distinction Science, Research and Technology. So really leading that field at the moment. Congratulations. Thank and you. That was a very surprise to get that award. But I thought this one was important to mention. And uh, the next speaker is uh, Tim Kiefer. We just heard uh, Megan uh, um, and um, uh, and Gregory talk about uh, biocide and other cell therapies. Tim is a professor here at UBC in uh, the Department of Cell Physiological Sciences and Surgery. Uh, he's been around. He, he did his uh, postdoc at uh, <clears throat> he did his PhD at UBC, which is always a good thing, and he did his uh, postdoctoral work at Harvard, and uh, uh, um, eventually uh, came to UBC. And as recently, I mean recently, a few years ago, but not that many, been for a year in the Center for IPS Cell Research and Application at Kyoto University. And that's where Yamanaka sits. Um, so <clears throat> team has been uh, uh, leading the uh, search for a cell therapy uh, for uh, uh, diabetes. And uh, I must say, this is quite impressive considering the competition. Uh, so um, I hope uh, that is going to tell us about the uh, clinical trial that is either ongoing or recently concluded uh, and for which there's a bunch of patients in Vancouver walking around with these cells in their body. Uh, Tim, you have the floor, please. Thank you, Fabio. Can you see my screen okay? Yes, but you are on uh, the presenter mode. If you can uh, switch the screen to okay. presentation. How's that? This like, yeah, perfect. Okay, um, so thanks Fabio. Um, yes, um, there's a lot of competition in industry and I think, I guess one of my messages here is work with them, not against them. Um, I'm gonna talk about basic science uh, leading up to the clinical trial and, and show you some data from the clinical trial and really everything I'm going to tell you was facilitated by working closely with industry. So um, I guess I would be amiss if I didn't highlight that we're sitting at the 100th anniversary now of the discovery of insulin. Um, clearly a remarkable Canadian achievement that has helped millions of patients around the world with diabetes. Um, but it really does remain a debilitating uh, condition due to the challenges of correctly dosing insulin. You give too little, you have high blood sugar, that damages tissues. Um, if you inject too much, you have low blood sugar acutely, that can cause a coma or even death. So um, we need to do something better. My motivation for working on a cell therapy came from my time in Edmonton, um, seeing the so-called Edmonton Protocol for Islet Transplant, and it really proved how well a cell therapy for diabetes can work. So what they do is isolate those insulin-producing cells from an uh, organ donor, purify them, it's only about a teaspoon, a few milliliters, infuse them into the portal vein of the recipient, and the results are shown on the right. So continuous glucose monitoring in someone with type 1 diabetes before ILA transplant. Blood sugar should be in the gray zone. You can see uh, the different colored lines or different days of the week. They spend a lot of time hyperglycemic, a lot of time hypoglycemic. And after this uh, infusion of a few milliliters of cells into their portal vein, it dials back their glucose control. It works remarkably well. So instead of injecting insulin, let's put in insulin producing cells. Why don't we do this with everyone? Because we don't have enough cell supply. So that brings up kind of the stem cell uh, vision, which is to recapitulate human development in a dish because we have an unlimited supply of human pluripotent cells, whether they be starting with embryonic stem cells or iPS cells. Um, and by exposing those cells to small molecules, we can, in the dish, make them mimic the stepwise developmental pathways to become insulin-producing cells. What I'll show you that's quite interesting is we only need to get halfway 
what we call stage four or pancreatic endoderm or pancreatic progenitors, we can then implant those cells and they will finish the differentiation uh, in vivo. And I'll show you some examples of doing that or transplanting more advanced cells. So first, let's look at these stage four cells. These are some cells two weeks after differentiation in the lab. They're marked by two key transcription factors, NKX 6.1 and PDX1. And on the top, I'm just showing the similarity with human fetal pancreas. So here's our stem cells. Here's human fetal pancreas. Very little insulin in the material. A lot of it is co-localized with another hormone, glucagon, but it really resembles human fetal pancreas. Now, in terms of implant, we want to think about, um, you heard Gregory talk a little bit about um, the, the concept of a universal cell. Another approach to block immune attack is to shield the cells. Um, we'll probably hear from Sam's wonderful technology at the end talking about bioprinting. Another approach is so-called macro encapsulation. So here's a device with a pore. We load the cells in and seal it off. It gets vascularized, and the idea is it contains the cells within. Nutrients can get in, insulin can get out, but the immune cells that would like to kill these foreign cells can't get at them. Uh, the cells that we implant are immature. Remember, they're that stage four, but after several months, they kind of look like uh, strips of endocrine cells. This is a section through a device. They're put subcutaneously. And just for comparison, you can see those uh, scattered pancreatic islets in the human pancreas. So we're essentially making a uh, thin sheet of cells in one of these devices that can then be implanted subcutaneously. So if we do this in mice, uh, here we're rending, rendering them diabetic by giving them a beta cell toxin. So they have high blood sugar. We put in a device in a mouse that's about the size of your, your fingernail, and after a few months, those cells mature and take over insulin production. We can measure human C peptide, which is co-manufactured with insulin from the cells. It goes up at the same time blood sugar is coming down. So we know our device is reversing uh, diabetes, in this case, in the mice. So this is with these uh, macro-encapsulated pancreatic progenitors. Now, uh, working with industry, um, I should mention this group at uh, Beta Logics, um, which was owned by Johnson & Johnson uh, before they shut down. Um, we had a great collaboration with them. I think we have about 12 papers over the last decade. Uh, this is a key one here, uh, which we reported uh, in Nature Biotechnology in 2014. Um, coming up with a protocol to make more mature cells. So I've just shown you stage four cells. Now I'll show you some stage six or stage seven cells. So our stage seven cells look like human islets. So here's human islets on the bottom. These are human embryonic stem cells differentiated using that protocol to stage seven. Uh, they have insulin and they have a number of key markers in their nucleus of mature beta cells. Uh, at the EM stage, we, uh, um, we can see uh, secretory granules containing insulin and they will release that insulin in a glucose-dependent manner. Um, if we compare the implant results with stage four, or in this case, stage six, we can see quite dramatic differences. So here again is our model of mice that are diabetic. Uh, we're implanting either five million stage four subcutaneously, uh, or six million, or sorry, two million of the stage six cells. And you can see the stage six cells uh, lower blood sugar faster, they produce more insulin or C-peptide, the animals have better glucose homeostasis. So we think that the further we differentiate them uh, in, the, in, in vitro before we implant, they'll be more potent and they'll ultimately reverse diabetes quicker. Now we've talked about Viacite. Viacite, uh, this California, California company, they're really the pioneers of getting stem cell based candidates into the clinic, and part of that is because of their devices. So they have two designs, one called PEC and CAP, designed to be a full barrier like the device I just showed you earlier with our mouse studies. And then they have another one that has portals which allow vascularization. The idea is we know vascularization is critical to cell survival and function. 
um, and the direct vascularization we think will uh, allow the cells to survive better than um, the full barrier devices. And I'll just quickly uh, show you some data comparing the two devices in two different models, mouse and rat. Um, first of all, these are non-diabetic animals. And what's interesting in the mice, which have higher blood sugar than humans or rats, the human cells after a few months will essentially take the mice down to a human glucose set point. This is pancreatic progenitors with the immunoprotective device or directly vascularized. Both worked in mice. Modest reduction in blood sugar in the rats, but they're already more human-like, so we didn't expect that. In the mice, we see improvements in glucose tolerance over time. You can see the controls in orange, and you can see by uh, 35 weeks post-implant, we've We've made the animals better than normal by implanting these human cells in both devices. Uh, again, more modest effects in the rats. The most telling data comes from looking at the human C-peptide. Both devices increased human C-peptide from undetectable to very high levels in the mice, but only the directly vascularized seem to work in the rats. And we think the rat model better predicts what's happening in the humans. Um, also, the directly vascularized devices, perhaps not surprisingly, had superior kinetics. They released insulin much quicker than the devices without the holes. So let's now look at what's happening with the clinical trials. We've got a great team here in Vancouver uh, that was very keen to, to work on this. I'll, I'll mention people at the end. Um, but I'm just going to show you quickly in the last couple of minutes data from 15 subjects. We've done more of this trial here in Vancouver than anywhere else in the world, although it's a multi-center trial. So the patients are getting these credit card thin devices uh, subcutaneously on their side. They're also getting smaller sentinel devices, kind of the rodent size that can be taken out at different times um, to see how the cells are doing. Again, these are patients with type 1 diabetes. Uh, just quickly um, looking at some of the parameters, we track their body weight, it's stable. They have less uh, hypoglycemic episodes. Um, and importantly, they spend, um, I'll show you in a moment, more time in, in the ideal glucose range, and that's accompanied by a lower insulin dose. So these patients still need insulin. We don't have them off insulin yet, but their dosing is going down. Here's the time and range of, of healthy blood sugar, 3.9 to 10 millimolar. You can see it increased over time, uh, and they're spending less time in the hyperglycemic range, greater than 10 millimolar. Perhaps the most exciting data, and I realize these are small, um, difficult to see, but we're being transparent here and showing individual data. So these are all 15 patients, um, and um, basically walking through an example here no C-peptide detectable in the patient at the start, minus uh, two weeks before implant. Week 26, you can see meal-regulated C-peptide. Week 52, so we followed them for a year now. C-peptide's gone up even higher, and it's meal-regulated. And you can see that in the majority of these patients. It's still low, much lower than, than it should be, but it really, I think, solidifies in my mind the potential that this can work. When we take those graphs out, uh, we see surviving cells that look like endocrine cells. Here's a device before it, uh, implant. Here's a retrieved 46 weeks after implant. The cells, however, are in pockets. So we've got to figure out why are they only surviving in, in pockets. Um, insulin and glucagon is present. Um, and I'm out of time, so I'll just summarize here with the trial results. Um, we've improved glucose control, reduced insulin requirements. Um, and as I've just shown you, meal responsive C-peptide, um, we see mature beta cells there. They, they certainly weren't at the time of implant, very encouraging. So I think for the first time we're providing evidence that stem cell-derived pancreatic progenitors can mature uh, into insulin-producing mature beta cells in patients with type 1 diabetes. I think there's a lot of excitement uh, moving ahead with this. The clinical path has been proven but we still have a lot of work. What's the optimal cell preparation? Where should we implant them? Uh, how should we protect them from immune attack? 
you know, we're considering um, something like a universal cell, for example, so we don't need to do a device. And there's all kinds of genomic uh, engineering we can consider. We're really only limited by our imagination at this point. So the clinical studies, um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Adam Ramsey, a great MD, PhD student who participated in all the, the implants, and, and David Thompson and Megan Levings and the surgeons. We really have a great group in Vancouver, lab members who have contributed to this, and really, as I said, could not have done this without uh, our collaborations with, uh, with uh, industry. So sorry I went uh, a minute over time, I think, but uh, hopefully there's some questions at the end. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the beautiful talk. I have a bunch of questions, but I can see there's more coming in the chat, and we'll just wait until the end. So uh, <clears throat> now, uh, you know, um, <clears throat> I don't want to waste too much time, so I'll immediately introduce Sam. Sam what was uh, has uh, uh, um, essentially spent all his adult life trying to de develop uh, uh, human tissue, engineered tissues. And uh, Sam founded, uh, together with a bunch of other people, um, 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 Aspect Biosystems uh, relatively recently, in 2013. And, uh, you know, I remember I visited the company in the early days. It was, you know, this tiny little place with four or five people. Well, now it has exploded. Um, I understand they have more than 50 employees. They have a very, uh, undergone a very successful uh, um, funding round, and uh, they have uh, devised a very interesting business uh, model that I hope uh, Sam will tell us a few things about, uh, based on a technology that essentially allows uh, to print using a microfluidic print head that allows precise positioning of uh, the printout, let's just say. And uh, I am looking forward to hear what Sam's got to say. So, Sam, please take it away. Great. Thanks, Fabio. Um, I will just share my screen here. Okay. So, you should all be seeing my full screen now. Is that coming through okay? Correct. It's good. Great. Thanks very much. Um, so, yeah, thanks for joining everybody, um, and thank you for the introduction, Fabio. Um, as you said, um, Aspect kind of span out from UBC uh, a few years ago now, 2013, and we um, were really incubating on campus for uh, several years after that, and then um, about three or four years ago, we moved off campus and uh, moved into our own space, still in Vancouver, so our headquarters and, and lab operations are still based here in, in Van. Um, and effectively, what we're trying to do as a company is take the bioprinting technology, that unique 3D printing technology that we span out from UBC, and combine that with novel biomaterials and novel cell technologies to develop bioprinted cellular therapeutics. Um, and I'll go into more detail about the specific diseases that we're focusing on and, and how we got to this business model of being a therapeutics company developing these bioprinted tissues. Um, but first, I'll just briefly describe our technology so that um, you know, we all kind of understand where we're coming at this from. Um, the unique aspect of uh, 3D printing that Aspect developed was really taking the concepts of microfluidics and combining that with 3D printing. And what I mean by that is that the print heads that we, that we developed and that we use are a microfluidic device. Um, I don't know if you can see my, my picture here, but I'm holding one of these print heads in my hand. It's about the size of a USB stick. Um, these silicone devices um, contain multiple channels, uh, and each channel has a valve that we can open and close. And that basically regulates the flow of cell-containing biomaterials through the channels of the print head. So we inject liquid biomaterials into the print head, uh, we're able to mix materials, switch between different cell types, switch between, uh, you know, mix multiple materials on these print heads. Uh, and then we cross-link that material on the print head to generate a cell-containing hydrogel fiber. And it's that fiber that is then deposited from the nozzle of the print head. And so what this really enables us to do is, is several things. We're able to print with quite fragile cells. 
um, it's a very low shear stress environment. Uh, and so cells like primary cells, clusters of cells, uh, stem cells, we're able to print those uh, and maintain very high viability. So it's a very cell-friendly printing technology. Um, I mentioned that we're able to switch between different materials and, and we can do this seamlessly from the same print head. So we don't need to bring multiple print heads into, into play to switch between materials. We can do that all from the same print head. And so that means we can position different cell types in very accurate ways within a 3D structure. Um, and I also said that we were able to mix multiple materials uh, on the print heads. And so we're able to print several materials simultaneously into a single fiber. And what that means is that you can have a fiber that's only a few hundred microns in diameter, but it contains multiple shells with different materials or different cell types in each layer within that fiber. And, and that becomes quite important when we're talking about generating um, allogeneic cell therapies. And so I'll touch on that core shell fiber architecture in a second. So um, really that microfluidic capability enables us to have control over the micro scale at the fiber level. But because of the 3D printing technology, this also gives us control over the macro scale. And so we're able to take those fibers and print them and pattern them into these macro structures that basically are our 3D printed tissues. These are our bioprinted tissues for implantation. And uh, we're able to control the, the macro design, the fiber patterning, the fiber spacing, all of these different parameters that you would expect from a, a 3D printing technology, we can apply to this bioprinting technology. So we have micro scale control at the fiber level, and then we have macro scale control at the tissue level. Um, and we're really working with a variety of different collaborators to try to kind of maximize the value of this technology. We have academic groups around the world who have our printing technology. Uh, there are two machines at UBC, uh, and uh, there are multiple other machines around the world. Um, and these academic groups are all focused on generating different types of 3D tissues, uh, but all fundamentally leveraging this microfluidic platform. Uh, we also have industry collaborators that we work with, uh, and those are also uh, involved in a variety of different tissue types. Now, initially, um, the business model that we had was focused on developing uh, 3D printed tissues for disease modeling and for um, drug screening and drug development. And one of our initial tissues that we developed was a, a contractile airway tissue. My background is respiratory medicine, and so I was interested in how the airways contract in diseases like asthma and in more chronic diseases like COPD. And so we developed a printed airway smooth muscle tissue that was able to contract and relax in response to appropriate uh, agonists, um, contractile agonists, and relax in response to uh, anti-asthma drugs. Uh, and so we have academic collaborators who are using this kind of tissue format, and we also had a couple of industry collaborations that were leveraging the same contractile tissue. The cells that we were printing were primary airway smooth muscle cells. We printed them into a ring-like structure, and those cells are able to uh, proliferate, deposit their own matrix, and differentiate into a contractile phenotype. Uh, and the data you see on the right is uh, from a publication we had a couple of years ago where we were characterizing the contraction of these tissues in response to histamine. So we measure the area of the tissues using video microscopy, and a drop in area reflects a contraction of the tissue. Uh, and that contraction happens quite quickly. It's just over about 10 or 20 minutes, we get to that maximum contractile value. Uh, and then we can relax the tissues back to normal with dexamethasone. Um, so, actually, sorry, not dexamethasone, with um, uh, the beta-2 agonist. So, uh, you know, we, we were able to demonstrate that we, were, we could print a viable and functional tissue that really has a very physiologically relevant um, function that was relevant to disease modeling. But we realized that actually the, the true value of this bioprinting platform is not necessarily generating tissues for disease modeling and helping others develop therapeutics, but it's actually to uh, print with therapeutic cells to develop our own therapeutic tissues. And so that's really where the company kind of matured to and where we're focused now. 
So we're now leveraging this printing platform to develop our own pipeline of cell-containing therapeutic tissues. And it's really based on this concept of having a multi-layered fiber that we can print. Uh, and so what we're doing is we're loading the therapeutic allogeneic cell, um, and I'll go through some of the examples of these therapeutic cells in a couple of slides' time. But the therapeutic cells are loaded into the core of a fiber. Um, the shell of the fiber um, is a cell-free perm-selective material that basically protects those therapeutic cells from direct immune attack, um, but also enables the free diffusion of uh, oxygen, nutrients, and in the case of pancreatic tissue for diabetes, insulin and glucose. So we we're able to generate these multi-layer fibers that encapsulate therapeutic cells and protect them from immune attack. Uh, and we see this as being a fundamental building block for therapeutic tissues that would avoid the need for having the patients go on immune suppressants. So we're able to protect the cells from immune attack to avoid um, any, any need for immune suppression of the patient, which could be transformational in the, uh, the field of cell therapy. One of the other advantages of having a bioprinting approach is that you may need a fiber that is tens of meters in length to load enough therapeutic cells to have an effect to, to cure a disease. If you just have that kind of 20, 30 meter long fiber randomly oriented in the patient, then it will pack together like a big pile of spaghetti and you may well end up with areas of necrosis uh, where the oxygen can't access the therapeutic cells. So actually being able to pattern these fibers into controlled 3D macrostructures becomes very important because we can package that fiber into a macrostructure that maintains constant function uh, and, and enables us to control uh, just how much um, necrosis, if any, we, we have in that macro tissue. So packaging these long therapeutic fibers into a patterned macro device we think is going to be very important. It also means that we can retrieve the device. So if we have a stem cell containing therapeutic and we want to be able to retrieve the device after implantation for safety reasons, this ability to pattern the fiber into a macrostructure is also quite important. So we, we're really applying this technology to various different uh, tissue types, um, including uh, liver tissue is one area that we're interested in for a variety of chronic and acute diseases but also pancreatic tissue for the treatment of type 1 diabetes. That's really our most uh, mature indication that we're, we're pursuing, and so I'll focus the next slide on our pancreatic tissue. Um, and I should say that we, we're collaborating very closely with Tim Kiefer and, and Megan Levings on, uh, on this tissue um, therapeutic. And, uh, and particularly with Tim, what we're doing is we're uh, using both primary islets and stem cell derived beta cells and packaging those into these core shell devices. Uh, those core shell fibers with the uh, therapeutic pancreatic cells um, are then uh, in these animal studies, they're loaded into the intraperitoneal cavity of, of the mouse. Uh, the data I'm showing you here is from immune deficient animals. Uh, and those islet loaded fibers are maintained in the animal for, um, for several months. Um, the, the images of the fibers you're seeing here are after one month, we've taken these fibers out of the animal, we've done live dead staining, the islets are viable at, uh, at that one month period. Uh, and they're also highly positive for dithisone, which is a surrogate for insulin staining. Uh, and so they're also um, highly insulin positive, which is a good sign of islet health. Uh, in a disease model where we trigger diabetes with an injection of streptozotocin, uh, the chart in the center of the slide shows um, a rapid increase in blood glucose in the animals as they lose their pancreatic beta cells and therefore lose their ability to control blood glucose. At day zero, we implant these islets containing tissues. We see a rapid return to normal glycemia. Interestingly, because these are human cells, the set point for human blood glucose is about five millimolar. So the uh, the blood glucose in the animals drops down below what it usually is in a mouse, which is about 8 millimolar. And that blood glucose is maintained out to around 90 days, so around three months post-implantation. 
uh, and it's uh, associated with a corresponding increase in detectable human C peptide in these animals as well. So we're seeing a restoration of normal glycemia by these implanted tissues and a corresponding rise in the secretion of human C peptide, uh, which corresponds to the human insulin that these islets are secreting. Uh, we're in the process of confirming these studies in immune competent animals and, uh, and demonstrating the corresponding immune protection uh, of, of these implanted cells. Um, very quickly, in the last sort of couple of minutes here, I want to give you a quick insight, like under the hood, of what we do at Aspect. And, and part of this is uh, really kind of developing biomaterials um, that have the best chance of success in vivo. And so we have really a, a, a large palette of, of potentially applicable biomaterials here, uh, some alginate-based, others based on synthetic peptides. Um, and we try to narrow those down uh, by using various in vitro assays. Printability is obviously highly important to us, but other assays including permeability, uh, mechanical testing, uh, viability of cells loaded within these biomaterials, and protein binding uh, to reflect foreign body response. We narrow down our, our lead generation for the biomaterial through these in vitro assays, and, and then we do our sort of lead optimization of the biomaterials using our in vivo studies. Uh, and so the winning biomaterials are kind of you know elucidated through these immune deficient and immune competent in vivo studies. And so that's just some insight into how you know we do our biomaterial development for aspect. And then I, I want to just also highlight how um, because you know we want to develop this as a commercialized therapeutic, this bioprinting demonstration of tissue efficacy is just one piece of the whole kind of story uh, when we're trying to develop these commercialized tissues. And so even before we print, um, there's this whole process flow diagram that I show on this slide. So pre-printing, uh, we need to think about things like accessing cells under GMP, whether they're primary cells or a stem cell derived source. We need to characterize those cells for functionality we need to characterize the biomaterials and ensure GMP characteristics of the biomaterials. All these things happen even before we print. After printing, we need to characterize the tissues that are printed for functionality, sterility, shipping, storage, all of those kinds of things need to be done as well. But as far as the tissue printing and manufacturing is concerned, there are some things that are specific to the bioprinting process that we're focused on, unsurprisingly here. Uh, and these include things, things like using machine learning and machine vision to uh, really guarantee the quality of the printed fiber throughout the tissue manufacturing process. Uh, and we think that things like this, um, you know, the quality control over the fiber level and the quality control over the tissue could give us an opportunity to set the standard with regulators for um, the, uh, the bioprinted therapeutic tissue. Uh, kind of field as a whole. We're one of the, in fact, probably the, one of the first companies in the world to develop bioprinted cell therapies. And, and we think that this is an opportunity to really set the standard for the, uh, the regulatory processes of these, of these types of cell therapies. Sam, you have, uh, you know, one minute left. Thanks, Fabio. Yeah. Um, so, I, yeah, I think the last, uh, the last thing I want to say is that, um, you know, this was all done through um, several different collaborations, um, both academic and industry collaborations through the course of our history. And I just want to thank all the people that have been involved, both at Aspect, but also uh, our many collaborators as well. And uh, with that, thanks very much. And I guess we'll move on to the discussion. Thank you very much. This is uh, very exciting. I hadn't heard you speak about your uh, future plans in a while, and I'm impressed by the development, I must say. So now I would like to open the floor for discussion. Um, <clears throat> we, I have a bunch of questions that came in throughout your presentations, and I am uh, going to ask them now. And uh, I will start in order, because that's how I wrote them down. So uh, <clears throat> the uh, first question is for our first speaker. And uh, um, Gregory, I have a personal question for you, to be completely honest. You have been through a few companies, and uh, you seem to always know when is the right time to jump to the next one. 
I was wondering, you know, is there any wisdom that you can advise us with? How do you choose, uh, you know, the next adventure, and and how do you decide that the, you know, your contribution to the previous one it's over? Why aren't you still with Astellas? That's that's a deeply difficult question to answer. Um, you know, I think that um, it. There's a certain level, I view an industry as pockets of capital that are all trying to work together towards the same end goal of human health, right? And so it's like, when is it time to go from one pocket of capital to another pocket of capital? And to that end, it's all about, you know, where do I bring value? So it's, you know, it's not about pay, it's not about things like, what do I do that I'm good at? Um, and can it help other people? And what happened was, you know, Universal Cells peaked. Um, I took Estellas to a certain point, um, and I have known, you know, Peter and Emily and Shreya for many years, and I watched Notch grow up, and, and it was at a point where I was like, you know, I think I can bring a lot of value to Notch, and that was what made the decision for me. Like, where can I bring value? Very good. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to switch to Megan now, um, and this is a question that, you know, essentially everybody can participate in answering because it's a complex question. And, uh, you know, we just heard from Gregory about universal donor cells and uh, also from Tim, he was mentioning universal donor cells. And it seems to me that universal donor cells are a bit of an alternative to CAR T regs, at least for what concerns cellular therapies. Obviously, for organ transplantation, there is no alternative to CAR T regs at the moment. So, do you have any any opinion on, you know, relative advantages and disadvantages? Um, do you think CAR T cells will be bioprinted by Sam in his construct eventually, or, you know? I think that's what they want me to do with them. I, th I have a call with them in a couple of weeks. That's probably the idea. Uh, so, and, um, so you had lots of different questions there. So, taking a step back, um, you know, this is a big question. What is the role of these third-party cells going to be? I, I probably think there's room for both the personalized and the third-party approach. The challenge for Tregs in particular has been, so far, it hasn't been possible to make CD4 lineage T cells out truly out of iPS cells. So, but I'm sure once that technology develops, and I'm sure it will, there'll be it'll make them much easier. They'll be a easier to roll them out across the, the market. Um, one of the big challenges for Tregs is that we still don't really understand how they work. And having a full understanding of the suppressive mechanisms of action is probably key to having confidence in a third uh, party IPS drive cell therapy. Um, they're a lot more complicated than a cytolytic T cell that just has to you know, make some cytokines and <laughs> secrete some cyt cytotoxic molecules. Tear eggs are much more sophisticated. Um, and then this, what was the other question? The third party and then the... Well, I you know, just in general. Oh, the, the co-printing. Yeah, the co-printing. Yeah. So I think actually that's, that's kind of, in my mind, the next frontier of immunology is understanding how T cells or other immune cells interact with non-immune cells because immunologists have been hyper-focused on their one little cell type and kind of ignoring the rest of the body. And um, that's, we started to do some of those experiments ourselves looking at how regulatory T cells interact with uh, intestinal organoids, for example, or working with Tim and Bruce um, Richard to see how they interact with islets. And I think that really is the next frontier, and I would definitely anticipate that these regenerative medicine products are going to be combinations of immune and non-immune cells. So, for example, and this is a question, I guess, between you and Tim, um, would you put your, your cells inside the biocyte device, or would you deliver them systemically? And do they really only need to act? at the site of transplant? I mean, a lot of uh, T-cell activity, uh, activation and, and, and things like this, you know, happens in lymph nodes and, you know, antigen spreading and everything. Um, yeah, I think mean, uh, maybe I'll answer first. So for, for Tregs, the basic science tells us if you really want them to induce tolerance and reshape the host's immune system, they need to be in the lymph nodes. Right. So I think printing them in the device only would not give you their full benefit. Okay, thank you. 
Tim, a uh, question for you. Uh, two questions, actually. The first one is, if you look at your uh, preclinical data in the, in, in the animals, in vivo, you know, both the device, let's say the, the device with the holes and the device without the holes, so the one that uh, completely excludes the immune cells and the one that allows them in, they, there is no huge difference in insulin secretion and, and uh, glucagon. And I think the only thing that you pointed out was different was C-peptide. Um, so why is it that you guys decided to go with the, which device did you put in humans and why did you pick that one over the other one? Sure, good question. So the um, initial studies we did were with mice and the um, fully encapsulated device works quite well. Viasite had similar data. They put that in patients. I didn't have time to show you, but there was no detectable insulin coming out. When they looked at the devices, they found a fibrotic response, a foreign body response that basically had choked off the, the blood supply and there was poor survival of the cells. They're now working with Gore to re-engineer the membranes to try to get that device to work where they don't get a foreign body response. In the meantime, they said, okay, let's test this idea um, by putting holes in it, allowing vasculature in. Um, and that worked in rats. The other one didn't work in rats, so that's why I said maybe the rats are a, a better model. And now we're getting, you know, some decent meal-regulated uh, surviving um, beta cells producing insulin in these patients, and it's having a physiological effect. So to me, that's a great step. Um, where this is going to go in the future, I can imagine there's going to be a whole spectrum of products, and I'm really excited by uh, Sam's data. Uh, from Aspect, I think that's a real innovative way to to make um, a device that, you know, we can do a number of things. We can engineer it to, to be immunoprotective. We can get it to release locally small factors. We can put other cells in. They can print different structures with it. I think, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty innovative. So excited to see how that moves forward. Yeah. I have one more question for you. So sure. in the last slide, you were showing the survival of the cells is one in one of these devices, and you were showing that it's still regional, is is patchy, mm -hmm. right? Is mm -hmm. that uh, uh, dependent on whether the vascular system reaches that area or not, or is there some other factor? Yeah, that is great question. So we're looking at that right now. My hypothesis is those surviving pockets will be adjacent to where the uh, vasculature was able to get in. But that's just a hypothesis. We've got a lot of analysis to do to figure that out. Are yeah. you potentially thinking that perhaps a proangiogenic therapy factor, you know, whatever material yeah. would be? Yeah, important? there's lots of people working in that field making VEGF or something. And that's, the again, the, the um, neat part of Aspect is you could include those materials in the ink, if you will, uh, that they're printing to promote vascularization. What we know from these clinical studies and our preclinical, vascularization is kind of the Achilles heel. Obviously, it's needed for cell survival, but it's, ob it's also needed for getting the, the um, therapeutic products out of the cells quickly and into the circulation. Insulin is a challenge because it's minute-to-minute -minute regulation. So we need a, that, that vasculature is really important. Yeah. Okay. Question for Sam now. So uh, this uh, idea of uh, you know having essentially what is a structured mesh uh, in which each filament is immunoprotected, presumably is made so that the vascular doesn't need to invade the construct and it can just run along the the this mesh. Um, and it's a brilliant idea. My question to you is. How stable are these layers in vivo? How long is the immunoprotection going to last that is given by the, you know, the outside sheet in your uh, multi-layer printed fibers? Uh, good question, Fabio. Can I just get Tim to answer? Because I think you're doing a much better job, Tim, of, of describing our technology here. Um, no, but I mean, it, it's a good question, Fabio. So, um, you know, I mean, one of the... I think the advantages that we have here is that we can pull from different types of, of biomaterials. And so, um, you know, the, the initial materials we're using are um, to, you know, a large extent, alginate-based. Um, alginate is relatively stable 
in vivo, there are no endogenous enzymes that can degrade it. Uh, and there are other things that we can do when we cross-link it to make it even more stable. So, you know, these kinds of, you know, selectively permeable hydrogels can be modified to be relatively stable. But I do think that, um, you know, that might work for a few months, but if you want a device that is, you know, having therapeutic effect for maybe a year or two, then I think some of these other complementary approaches will become much more important. So, you know, having a extended release of an anti-inflammatory factor or loading in, you know, something like a Treg cell population um, could give you that kind of more long-term immune evasion and therefore long-term efficacy. I have a question for you from David Knight, which is an interesting one. How complete is the protection? Can you screen out soluble proteins like perforin that would be secreted by T cells or is better if you don't? Yeah, I, I think again, like, you know, the permeability can be modified to some extent, but you, you obviously you need the materials to be permeable enough to enable diffusion of um, you know, oxygen, nutrients, but also the um, the factors that you need to sense. So glucose needs to get in and insulin needs to get out. Uh, and so you have a you know a size exclusion criteria that's basically set by by those molecules. You can't filter out anything smaller than that because then your therapeutic molecule won't be able to get out. So there is a, there is a size limit to, to what you can like enable to diffuse yeah. in and out. I guess the real question is, how finely can you control the size limit? Yeah, that, I mean, by, by using uh, different concentrations of materials, by using different types of polymers, the effective pore size can be controlled really quite well. Your, you know, you, you have kind of a, a size exclusion where, you know, anything below a certain size will get through, anything above a certain size won't. You can't kind of make the window, you know. Yeah, you can. Or maybe with two different layers, Sam. Think about it. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. No, I like your thinking, Fabio. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have a couple more questions if uh, we have time. Um, the last one for you, Sam, is how, how close do you think you are to have a, a, a GMP setup, like completely GMP, that you can actually claim that your bioprinted construct and all the components that are in it are GMP uh, compliant? Uh, I think one of the benefits of working in the type 1 diabetes space is that, as, as Tim described, um, there is a, a quite a long history of using cell therapy for the treatment of patients with T1D. So the regulators are familiar with the use of primary islets for the treatment of patients. Uh, the processes for isolating and purifying islets uh, under, under GMP are quite well defined. And so accessing that cell source under GMP is, is possible. Um, persuading the regulators that a primary cell therapy approach to T1D is, you know, is appropriate is, is also something that's been done. Um, and so then it's a case of kind of making sure that the materials are, are a GMP, which again can be, uh, you know, basically purchased under the appropriate levels. Uh, and so then it comes down to like, can we actually put all these pieces together under GMP? Um, and that's a, that's a more complicated story because we have to build that ourselves. Um, and we're in the process of doing that. So, um, you know, one of the good things about being in Canada is there is lots of interest and funding available for biomanufacturing, uh, and um, and so yeah, we're in the process of, of funding that and trying to build our own infrastructure to do, it. especially recently. Okay, last question yeah. to everybody: um, What do you think is missing in Vancouver to get your amazing discovery work faster to the clinic and the translation? Well, if we're if we're talking about cell therapy, I think the the GMP cell manufacturing and regulatory knowledge is number one on my list. I think if we'd had that in place, we would not have partnered with a company at such an early stage. We would have tried harder to do it on our own. Um, and um, and I, I also now that I have lots of companies coming to me, some of the first one of the first things they'll ask is, do you have your own GMP facility? And then when they hear you don't, they're less interested. So 
I think that that's the critical thing that Vancouver needs to get in place. For what it counts, I completely agree with you, and we are working on it. We'll get it soon. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you, David, for putting this together. I know that uh, this is due to the fact that you were frustrated that your uh, beer Thursdays uh, not, cannot proceed under <laughs> COVID, but uh, I guess that was a good thing eventually. And, uh, yeah, if you want to say a few words in closure, you are. Uh... Don't worry, Fabio. Your Drinks will be back. Connected. Um, yeah, I'd just like to thank everyone. This is a, a you know a, a great session and. and...